If you got your Bible, you got a good thing. Amen. Open up to 1 John chapter 3 uh, and Romans chapter 6 will be uh, the areas where I'll have you turn to today. Uh, most everything else should be up on the screen or uh, I'll make reference to uh, as we go. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, as we move forward in our new year, uh, 2023, uh, you know, uh, every now and then, I think you have a particular year that's going to be a little more important than uh, maybe some other years uh, for different reasons. Obviously, 2023 is going to be an interesting year for this church. Um, we uh, uh, will be done with our lease here in uh, June, uh, so we'll have to make some, uh, obviously, some very big decisions about uh, where we're going next, what we're doing, uh, how that's going to look like. Uh, obviously, now that the new year is here and we're starting to get closer, uh, we're going to start having to have some real conversations uh, about that. Uh, no, not really uh, much we can do when we're not when we're still kind of far out, but now we're getting close. So, uh, in the upcoming weeks, we'll be having those conversations. So, be in prayer about that. Just be in prayer that the Lord's going to lead us uh, in the right direction and and where we should be and what we should do and all those things. Uh, because uh, this is never uh, an easy decision to make, obviously. Um, you know, I, I don't know, uh, and I say this with all due respect to everybody, um, you know, obviously as the pastor of the church, it's something that weighs on me a lot um, when you start having to think about, uh, you know, what are we going to do? Um, I really can't wait to the day and, and look forward to the day if the Lord uh, sees fit uh, that we kind of, get a permanent spot where we don't have to worry about this stuff anymore uh, because it will put a load off my mind for sure. Uh, but at the end of the day, we will be where the Lord wants us, and I, I have to trust and be uh, faithful to that as well. Um, you know, this church has been in one, two, three, four, five. This is our six, seventh different place. Eighth different place. It's our eighth different place since we've been together, and we've been together for a uh, little over 10 years now. So, uh, uh, hey, uh, but the Lord has always provided. We've always had a place to go, and uh, I believe he'll do it again. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, come, come June 30th, we'll, we'll have a plan, and, and we'll, we'll put that plan into place, and whatever the Lord decides is what the Lord decides. Um, the other thing that I do need you to be in major prayer about, and I'm very serious about this, um, my kid's going to be driving here in a couple of weeks on his own. Um, he's turning 16 this year, uh, which means he will be driving on his own, uh, which means all you need to get off the road. Uh, that's number one. Uh, no, well, actually, that's not true. He's actually a much better driver than what I've seen here in Jacksonville. So um, I'm more worried about the other people than I am him. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, that's exciting. 16. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where does the time go? Um, yeah, uh, I felt old a long time ago, but that makes me feel old too, yes. Uh, but I'm never going to be as old as Ray. That's all I care about. As long as I'm never as old as Ray, I'm good. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, we're in 1 John chapter 3. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, I was, I, was, uh, I was looking at it and I'm like, all right, you know, what should we do this week? You know, I was looking at it a couple weeks ago as I was preparing for this. And I was like, uh, you know, where should we go? Should we, should we do kind of a New Year's message on, or should we just get back into 1 John? You know, I'm like, you know what? I think let's just get back into 1 John, and let's just, let's just roll with that, and, and, and we'll go with it. And, uh, and then I read it. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, this is a tough passage to be starting the New Year's with. Uh, but that ain't going to stop us, is it? Amen. Tough passages, we'll deal with them. And so we're going to deal with it because this is a tough passage. Uh, but I think, it's, you know, as I thought about it and I prayed about it, I'm like, you know what? Um, as we move into 2023, uh, it, it probably would be a good message for us to hear. So I just want you to know right up front, uh, uh, I know this is a tough passage. It's kind of got some hard stuff in there. Uh, and, and, but hey, but at the end of the day, it's God's word. And if God speaks it, then so be it. Amen. And maybe he has us right here for a reason. Maybe we need to hear this message. And so let's just go with that. Uh, again, um, as we look at first John 
and, and we look at this particular chapter, the, 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 these first uh, uh, ten verses, and, and actually the whole chapter moving into the next chapter, uh, we're asking this question that I want to pose to us. Um, and, and, and listen, I can't answer the question for you, okay? Uh, all you can do is examine yourself with Scripture and, and answer it honestly before the Lord, okay? And, and do know, you can fake it with everybody else, but you can't fake it with Him, okay? Uh, but here's the question. Who are you? Who are you? Uh, I think it's a question that is worthy of our thoughts. First John was written to distinguish what real Christianity looks like over the counterfeit, if you remember, uh, as we've talked about that. John, the Apostle John, uh, I was telling Chris on the way in this morning, he's, he's, he's probably one of my favorite authors of, of Bible books. Obviously, he wrote probably my famous fa favorite book, which is Revelation. Uh, but the thing that I love about John is, uh, and, and I love the Gospel of John and, and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, uh, is, man, <laughs> you know, I, I know everybody's got their place and everybody's got their, uh, you know, everybody that, that had the, the privilege of writing Scripture uh, obviously is important. But, man, you know, there's something about John. For me, uh, this guy, had, he was the inner circle of Jesus, the inner of inners. You know, he was the, the disciple that the Bible says Jesus loved. Not that he didn't love the other ones, but there was something about John. He just had, I think, that, that special relationship with Jesus where he just got it. He just got it. And, you know, for me, that's always been the precedence of how I've tried to pastor this church. And, 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 and what I mean by that is, I don't want this just to be a church. I want this to be a people that get it. That we, just, we get it, man. We got it. We understand we're not going to let all this outside noise uh, interrupt our fellowship with the Lord and with one another. And that's a very difficult thing to do, is try to get everybody on the same page with Him. It's not on with me, it's with Him. And we live in such a day uh, where, man, that's very difficult. And over the 10 years that we've been in this church, you know, uh, maybe I've done it, gone about it, in a way that maybe you wouldn't have gone about it. Or, or maybe I, you would have said it differently than the way I said it. Or, or maybe whatever. But, in all, but at the end of the day, what I am saying is right. Because it's biblical. And we are living in a day, man, where church does not look like what it was supposed to look like. We have gotten so far away from it. And, and so, John, for me, is special and the writings of John is special because man, he just really goes for it. He does. He just gets, he cuts through all the red tape and he just goes for it. And I think the reason why he's able to do that is because he understood Jesus, man. He got, I'm not so sure, this is just conjecture, I'm, I know that. But, you know, I'm not so sure that sometimes when some of these other biblical authors, they really, really understood what it was the Holy Ghost was moving them to write. Maybe they didn't understand it. I think John understood it. I think John understood everything he was writing. Because I think he had that intimate relationship with the Lord that we all should strive for. We really should. And uh, I think you see that uh, in his writings. Obviously, First John, man, you, he's really going for it. He's concerned with people who did not practice what they preached. John is writing to supposed believers as some that say they are believers and challenging the reader to be genuine, not to be fake. He is, he is almost saying, without saying it, hey, examine yourself. He uses that word if throughout this, this uh, epistle, uh, what was it, 28 times I think or something like that. Like He's, 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 he's challenging us. Who are you? Who are you? John was concerned with counterfeits. See, he knew intimately the real Lord. And he knew what it was we as his uh, people should look like. And he was very concerned with counterfeits. To deal with such, John directs his epistles focus on not the byproduct of the counterfeit, 
but rather on the byproduct of the real deal. Uh, making application, as we, talked, uh, we have talked about over the weeks, uh, uh, in a- Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. See, here's the, here's the reality of it all, right? If you, do not know, if you do not know what is real, you're open to falling for what's not. Did y'all hear what I just said? Hear that again. If you do not know what, it's, what is real, then you've opened yourself up to fall for what is not. And, and man, I really believe uh, with all uh, humility as I say this, I believe there's many people that are in church this morning, man, they really don't know what's real and what's not. Now, whether that be their own fault, ultimately we're all going to be uh, held uh, accountable for ourselves, or, or whether that be because someone else has deceived them uh, is, 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 I guess, neither here nor there. But the reality is, it's true. Here's a question I want to pose. Is it possible to believe in Jesus Believe in all the right things, but yet miss the thing that brings eternal life. That's a big question. And this is something that bothers me, and this is something that has driven me uh, in this ministry, and, and, and I take it seriously, and it's a heavy weight on me. As I've watched people come and go through this church, and I've watched how people, even within this church, act and, and display and how they uh, conduct themselves, uh, you know, man, <clears throat> you know, uh, I, I think it's, 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 it's a tough thing when you know what Scripture says and you're watching somebody not display the qualities of what a Christian should display <clears throat> and you're trying to help them see that or you're trying to, to work with them on that and they just don't want to see it. But listen, Acts 16.30, I want you to, to really pay attention to what it says here. It says, uh, and remember, it's, it's when Paul ha- was having that conversation with the Philippian jailer. He says, uh, 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 Sirs, the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? Okay, that's a big, th- there it is right there. And what it says there, and I want you to pay attention to what it says. And it said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Is that what it says? In and on are two different things. This is why I think your King James Bible is so important. One word can change everything. It doesn't say believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And somebody might say, well, what's the difference? The devils believe in Jesus Christ, and they tremble. Are they saved? No. No, it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is trusting on Jesus Christ. It's not Jesus and anything else. It's Jesus plus nothing. Do you understand? Okay? Acts 4.12 tells us that there's no other name among, uh, uh, under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We believe on Jesus Christ. It has to be Jesus Christ. It has to be the engrafted Word that saves your soul. It has to be. And I think there is a very fine line between easy believism that's being taught in many, many churches this morning and Lordship Salvation, which is also being taught in many, many churches. I don't believe in easy believism, and I don't believe in Lordship Salvation. But I definitely lie somewhere in the middle there, okay? Because somewhere in the middle is the actual truth. And yet, Matthew 7, 21-23 is still in the Bible. Many are going to say to him in that day, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. And, and, and I think that a message like that must be heard. It can't be just... You can't read a verse like that and not let it grab your attention. It has to. It's an important uh, reality. With the heart a man believes and with the mouth 
confession is made. But if there's no repentance, if there's no turning from your sin, if there's no forsaking the sin, if there's no laying down your life to receive His, I don't know that salvation has been had. I don't know that salvation has been had. And I am certainly not the one to uh, be able to judge anybody's salvation. I can't do that. I was telling Chris this morning, I said, you know, I don't ever question God. Not, I'm in no position to question God. But I think one of the most frustrating things for me as a pastor is when somebody's doing something that's clearly not scripturally correct, <laughs> like, you know, I look at that and I go, man, but if you have the Holy Ghost inside of you, how are you not being convicted that what you're doing is wrong right now? And if that's not happening, that's very frustrating for me because I certainly don't want to question anybody's salvation, but at the same time, what if they're not saved? You know, it's, it's, it puts me in a tough, tough spot because, you know, here's the thing, I really do actually care. I really do. I, I care enough to say something. And, and, and I, love, I love enough to say something. And, and here's the thing, right? What am I gaining by saying that? You know, it, 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 if I'm questioning where somebody's at in their walk, what do I have to gain? All I'm going to do, unfortunately, is make the other person angry at me. What do I have to gain? Why would I want to do that? Well, why I would want to do that is because for their sake... If there's a chance to get them to wake up and see on this side of it, uh, that's what you, you got to take that chance. So I'm asking this morning, who, who are you? Did you really trade your life for his? Or are you a counterfeit? I, again, I'm not questioning your salvation. I'm just simply asking you a question because I care. Again, this is a tough message, but it must be preached. And I'm sorry for that, but I'm not. <laughs> but I do love you enough to preach it. And even though it makes me look like I'm hard, and even though people are going to look at me and say, well, I can't believe that's what he preached on, on uh, New Year's Eve, uh, that's where we are in 1 John 3. And maybe we're here for a reason. And maybe as we kick off 2023, we all need to hear this message and really take the time to do what 2 Corinthians 13, 5 tells us to do. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Do you understand what he's saying when he says prove your own selves? What he's saying is, your life should be showing forth what you're claiming to be. Prove it. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves? Don't you know? I mean, you should know. Hey, did you really give your life for His or are you just faking it? Anybody can walk, talk the talk. You know, I've heard people say it around here many times. Anybody can speak Christianese. Anybody can do that. You can learn what the right things to say at the right times. But man, are you actually living it? Is Christ in you? Or are you a reprobate? What, what, what Paul's writing to this Corinthian church, which I think is very, very, very closely tied to the American church, is he's telling this hard-headed carnal church, hey, you better stop and look at yourself. Nothing wrong with doing that. Why do we get so offended by that? Is the evidence of your life showing forth real salvation? I want to remind you, it says, whether you be in the faith. And listen, I want to remind you what the Bible says about faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You cannot please God without faith. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing... By the Word of God. Is the Word of God, here's one of the biggest ways you can tell if you're either just faking it or if you're serious. Is the Word of God serious to you? 
Now, you can say it is, but if the Word of God's calling you out on something, you're still doing it, I would question whether it is. Is the Word of God really your authority? Is the Word of God really what you're living your life by? Does what Scripture say really drive you, or is it just words on a page? And you'll follow them when it's convenient, and you won't when it's not. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Listen, James 1, 5 through 8 says very simply, if any of you lack wisdom, if any of us lack wisdom, we need to ask of God. Why? Because he'll give to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it will be given to us. But let him ask in... What does that say right there? Faith. You want to know why he's saying that? Because when you're asking from wisdom from God, where does it come from? How many times I've heard people say, oh, I prayed about that. But yet what they prayed about did not line up with Scripture. It blows my mind. They still think that what they're doing is okay. <laughs> if you are praying about something or if your actions are displaying something that does not line up with God, then you know what you are? You're wavering. You're wavering. You don't even realize that you're resting Scripture. You're turning it to please you. You become the authority over Scripture. And it says that that type of person is, a, is blown about in the wind and tossed. And it says, For let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. Did you did all see what that says right there? That person will receive nothing from the Lord. And we look at that and we go, wait a minute, what about all the... The Lord does not and does not have to uh, accomplish what He said He would do for you if you are out of fellowship with Him. I know that's hard, but that's biblical. The Lord will not. You will be either the prodigal child or not a child at all. Either way, the Lord is not required to do anything for you or me, or anybody else for that matter. And it says that that person who is a double-minded man, he'll be unstable in all his ways. And man, can I just say, with all love, man, seriously, I've seen a lot of unstable, double-minded people come through this church. And I've seen a lot of unstable and double-minded people in this church. And I'm just telling you, man, do what you want, but we're getting close. And one day you're going to have to stand before him and you're going to have to give an account. And as much as I can, I'm going to do whatever I can to try to help you, help this church get right with the Lord. That is where I'm at, man, because I think that is the most important thing we can do. Don't be unstable in all your ways. You don't need to be. You have the Lord to guide you. You have pastors who love you and who want the best for you. Why would you not utilize what the Lord has given to you as your gifts? You know, Romans 8.16 tells us that the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What I don't understand... <sighs> Maybe it's my lack of, maybe it's my ignorance. I, I don't know what it is. What I don't understand is how sometimes people can do things that are so clearly biblically wrong and not see it. How, where, where That verse is in the Bible. How is the Spirit of God not showing them that, hey man, that was wrong. You need to fix that. I, 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 that blows my mind. I, and, and, miss, and listen, maybe, and, and maybe that person uh, really is saved. And, and maybe what it is is that person just needs to get right with him. But what scares me is what if the person's not and we just assumed they were? That bothers me. Either way, it, it's always good to examine ourselves. As we move into 2023, let's be right with Him. Amen? Yeah. 
Huh? We should want that. Listen, the reality is, if you are a practicer of sin, that is reason enough to examine yourself. It does not mean you're not saved. But at the same time, I cannot tell you uh, uh, how important it is to, to bring those things to light because the evidence of your life will bear witness. It always does. Y'all hear what I'm saying? We can talk all we want how much we love the Lord and how much we love each other and blah, 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 blah. And listen, we do need to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind. And we do need to love our neighbors as ourselves. The Bible commands that. But we can talk it all we want. But the reality is, when it's all said and done, the evidence of your life will bear witness. It always does. You can talk it all you want. My question is, does His Word move you to change? Or do you move to change the Word to fit that which you engaged in? Because that I see often through people. You know, what that Word says there applies to everyone else, but for some reason, somehow, some way, it doesn't apply to you. How is that? You know, we've been saying it like this, right? We have an incredible ability to lie to ourselves. And it's very sad. Real life is your life is his life. That's what John's saying here. Okay? Grab onto that. Real life is your life is his. That's real life. That's what it was supposed to be. It's what Adam and Eve was supposed to to be. And when the second Adam came, he gave us the ability to have that real life. Amen? Okay. And, and hey, praise the Lord for that because we could never have it without him. We are prone to the ugliness of our sin and what we are. Everything I just said here for the first 20 minutes, we are that without him. Here's the key. Do you want to stay that way? Or not. I didn't say you're not going to do that. We are. The question is, are you okay with it? Are you comfortable with it? Or not? Because if you're comfortable with it, there's where I would say, you might want to examine yourself. You should never be comfortable with sin. You should never be comfortable with going against God's Word. For any reason. Never making up excuses to why what you're doing is okay. When something says something in the Bible, unless God gives you an either or, there is no either or. And let me just help you with something. God never gives you an either or. It's always black or white in the Bible. It always is. It's either you're walking in the light or you're walking in the darkness. There is no middle because you know what God thinks about the middle. Revelation 3 is very clear on that. It makes him sick. To the point, he will throw it up out of his mouth, he says. Real life is your life is his life. This is the only way you will ever find abundant life. The truth is, if we are walking in the light... Our lives will back it up and it will be known and seen. If not, maybe we are walking outside of the fellowship of God. Maybe we are walking in darkness. And can I just help you and tell you that's a very dangerous place to be playing in in that sandbox. That's not a sandbox you want to play in. Because I'll tell you right now, your flesh, my flesh, will always win. Did I say that right? Let me say it again. It will always win. You'll never defeat it. What we've seen so far in 1 John is, the, is, is three major things that we've talked about in the first two chapters. If you remember one of those things is there's three birthmarks of what a believer should look like. You remember those? Right? What, was, what, what were those three things? Love truth, and obedience. Okay? This doesn't mean if you don't display those three three things, you're not saved. I I didn't say that. 
John didn't say that. What John did say, however, is though, if you are living the life of a true Christian walking in the light, you will have love. You will have love for God and you will have love for the brethren. If you are walking in the light, you will be obedient to His Word. If you are walking in the light, truth will be important to you. Okay? If you're looking at those three areas, you're going to go, you know, man, yeah, I, I, you know, I try to be obedient to Word, but you know, I'm not so, so sure that I have love for my brothers. Man, there's some people in this church that really annoy the Mm, out of me, and I don't really don't like that person over there, and that person over there, I don't know about that. I don't like the way that person does that, and I don't. All three. All three are the marks of a Christian. You don't get bonus points for one or two of them and the other third. No. No. A real Christian is doing all three. If they are not displaying them, because you can't do one without the other, is my point. If you're not displaying one, you're out of fellowship with the Lord. And that's the thing that John's trying to get us to see. Listen, it, you may have a problem with that person or you may be doing this or you may have a problem with that sin, whatever it is. Whatever the reality is in your life, you're walking in darkness. You're out of fellowship with the Lord. Does that sound important? Does that sound important? We need to take that seriously because it's serious. The other thing that we learn about is the kind of love God hates. Do you remember what that was? The love for what? The world, right? The love for the world is a kind of love that God hates. If you have one foot in the church and one foot in the world, you're walking in darkness. I know that we don't think that way, but it's the reality of it. You know, I was just talking to my wife yesterday, and me and Chris were talking about this coming. We've talked about a lot of things coming in, I guess. You know, we're, as I get older, and, and just respect what I'm about to say, okay, what I'm starting to learn is I really hate this world. I hate everything about this world. I don't hate people, but I hate their actions. People are so selfish, people are so about themselves. People don't care about other people. They really don't. They say it, but they really don't. People are so quick to judge. People are so quick to throw out ac accusations without knowing everything that's going on. People are so quick to do these. I have really gotten to the place where I don't like this world. I don't. I'm all for preaching the gospel to people who need the Lord. And, and for as long as the Lord wants me in this world... I will do that. But I don't like this world, man. People are selfish. You see it on the roads. You see it in the stores. You see, everywhere I go, all I see is selfish people. And all they care about is themselves. They don't, they, they have this little bubble that they're in, and that's all they care about. They don't care about anybody else. And I think that's very, listen, God help us if that's us. That should never be us, man. That should never be us. We are to be little lights in this world. And I'm telling you, do you want to know why? Now, 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 hear what I'm about to say, okay? Do you want to know why the church is failing today? Jesus and his church will never fail. But just because someone goes to church doesn't mean the church can't fail. The, the church is failing because People are not being taught right anymore. We're not being taught scripture anymore. We're taught, we are being taught to love ourselves. We're being taught to put our, ourselves above God. That's what's going on in many messages in churches this morning. And, and people look at that and they go, come on, Pastor. That, no, that is exactly what's going on. That's exactly what the devil is doing. He has flipped this thing around and it's all about us now. It's all about us. How we are the most. I hate to tell you, man, but we are not the most important thing. We're not even a blip on the radar. He's the most important thing. And there's no way he would have ever done what I see a lot of people do. And if he's in us, why do we do it? Why do we do it to one another? 
And God help us if we do it in the lost world out there. People are looking at us, and people are watching us. Love not the world. And then the final thing, and, and, and Pastor Robert kind of talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's preached the message, but what I would have put behind that uh, is, is we, get, we need to understand the seriousness of the matter. And what I mean by that is the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist is very real. It's very real. And listen, here's where I think a lot of Christians are losing their head on some things. You can be a Christian and still have the spirit of Antichrist. Did you hear what I just said? Because you can. Okay? And that's what John's saying here. What he's saying is, is, hey, you need to understand the seriousness of the, the seriousness of the matter. There are three marks to look for for one who's being controlled by the spirit of Antichrist. Now, when I tell you these three marks, which, by the way, are in 1 John chapter 2, just so you know that these are my made-up marks, when I tell you these, I really want you to stop and consider, number one, most importantly, have I ever displayed or do I display any of these marks? And number two, do I know people who have? Listen, one, they go against God and His ways to push their ways. You know, the in my opinion crowd with no scripture to back up what they're saying. That's the spirit of Antichrist. Your opinion outweighs God's opinion. They depart from fellowship. Whenever you break fellowship for an unbiblical reason, that is the spirit of Antichrist. That's what, that's what the Antichrist wants. That's what the devil wants. He is trying to put wedges between his, the people. Whether they're saved or unsaved, that's what he's doing. If we have broken fellowship with others and there's no biblical reason to why we've done that, Spirit of Antichrist. Because what they're doing is they're denying the faith. They're denying the Word of God. And then you don't want to know where that leads to? The deception to the faithful. They give excuses to why what they did was right. Bringing other people into their thought pattern and none of them have any Scripture to go for it. It's all spirit of Antichrist, my friends. And it's alive and well in the church, and I've seen it in this church quite often. And so now we come to 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to read the first 10 verses, and then we'll, uh, we'll start to break these down. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and if it does not yet appear, what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that had this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. And if you know that he was, a, he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth, doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. You know, in verse number 1, what John's talking about here is he says that they do not understand. We don't understand who we are because we do not understand that the Spirit of God's in us and that the Father has bestowed upon us such love. If we could understand that, 
so much of the problems we see in our churches, in our families, would go away. They would go away. Uh, I didn't tell you to turn here, but I'm going to have you turn here real quick now that I think about it. Go to 2 Corinthians 6 real quick. 2 Corinthians 6. Now watch what this says here. Look what Paul writes to the Corinthian church, starting in verse 14. It says, Be ye not, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Man, that sounds a lot like what Paul's, or, or what uh, John's talking about over there in 1 John. And, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and, they, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now watch. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You, you look back at that First John chapter 3 passage, and, and, and John comes right out of the gate saying, Behold what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us, that we should be called the son of, sons of God. And in verse 3 he says, Every man that had this hope in him purifies himself, i.e. 2 Corinthians 7.1. Y- y'all see that? Huh? Even as he is pure, we need to cleanse ourselves of these, these sinful ways. We need not be equally yoked with that. Come out from that. That's not you anymore. Sin brings forth death. Verse 4, whoso committeth sin transgress also the law. Sin brings forth death. And can I just offer you up this thing? I've said this so many times. I'll keep saying it because it's so true. If you are breaking fellowship with someone for an unbiblical reason and you have nothing behind it, what is death? Do you understand that? Do you understand that? Listen, if you are leaving a church for an unbiblical reason, I'm just telling you, man, one day you are going to meet your maker on that, and it's not going to work out well for you. Pastor, who do you think? I'm just telling you. Sin brings forth broken fellowship death. That's what it does. Well, man, pastor, I left my church. I've the church I was in for ten years to come here, or twenty years to come here. Are you saying that I was it a biblical reason? Listen, if they're not preaching from the King James Bible, I would tell you right there, there's a good reason to get out of that church. That's a biblical reason. Get out, gone. See you. If the church is dying, I would say that's a good reason to get out. Some, the, if the light sticks not in that church, get out. If truth's not being taught, if they're a uh, uh, when a church isn't growing, what's it doing? It's dying. If it's dying, that's a biblical reason to get out. Um, and churches don't need to grow necessarily by numbers. Okay? So let's just get that on the table. Numbers does not quantify whether a church is successful or not. What quantifies if a church is successful or not is if it's doing what it is. Are the people growing in the Word? If they are, then the church is not dying. You could have three people in the church and it'd be growing and be a better church than a 10,000 person church that's doing nothing. Do you understand? Okay, so, so I think there are some very good reasons why if, if the church is adulterating itself with the world, yes! I would say, not only do you need to get out, you need to run as fast as you can. If this church ever gets to the place where we're doing that, 
please get out of here. Do not stay. Okay? But, please hear me. For all your friends and families that go into other churches, and all you, all, but if the church is biblically correct, and you do not have a biblical reason, you fix that thing. You fix whatever the problem is. Don't just walk because you don't like something, in your opinion. Yeah. That's not a good reason to leave a church. It never was and it never will be. God is so very, very, very big. He's very big on family. He spends a lot of time talking about it in this book. You know he does. We've got to get right with him. We've got to. Sin brings forth death. Look at verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the... Sounds to me like that's a big thing to God. Sounds to me like the Lord is still, even today, not okay with sin. No matter what anyone tells you. No matter what excuses we make for it, and no matter what excuses we make for doing the things we did. Broken fellowship is sin. It always is. All the time. Doesn't matter that I'm saying it. The Bible says it. Do you remember what happened to Adam and Eve after they sinned in the garden? What happened? They had broken fellowship with God, and what did God do? Y'all, y'all with me now? I could give you all kinds of, of, of examples in the Bible. Let's just start there. Let's just start there. We've got to start taking these things seriously. The contrast that John has used in the Bible so far has been things like light versus darkness, love versus hatred, truth versus error. He's going to talk about that uh, even more here in 1 John 4. But, but today, what I want you to look at as we close out our message is he's contrasting the children of God versus the children of the devil. The first two chapters emphasize fellowship. The last three emphasize sonship. No one who is born of God, John's saying, practices sin. To practice sin is to sin consistently and as a way of life. It does not refer to committing an occasional sin. If you sin, that does not mean you're not saved. That's not what John's saying. What John is saying, though, is if you sin and you don't have anything in your heart to want to change what you're doing... Huh. Huh. something's not right, you need to examine yourself. That's what he is saying. Again, every great personality mentioned in the Bible, they sinned. God shows you that. Uh, Abraham, did he sin? Well, man, he lied about his wife. Uh, Moses, did he sin? Well, yeah, man, he lost his temper and disobeyed God. Did, 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 did David sin? Huh? Peter. How about that guy? Did Peter sin? He literally denied the Lord three times. Like, listen, the Bible doesn't say that we're not going to sin. But here's my question. Did Abraham stay in that sin? Did Moses stay in that sin? Did David stay in that? Did Peter? No. That's the key. That, what are you going to do with it once you've done it? Are you just going to excuse it? Or are you going to do something about it? And listen, man, I'll tell you right now, God will leave you in that thing for years until you take care of it. You could live in that, not taking care of it, and God won't move you a step forward, and He'll be patient. Forty years, just ask Israel how patient He can be about it. And I'm just telling you, man, we can't live there. Sin uh, cannot be a settled practice in our lives. We can't be okay with the sins we committed. We need to be able to get to the place where we understand, number one, I think that's where most people today in the, the Christian world, whether they're saved or not, I think that is the biggest problem. They can't see the difference of what sin is and what it isn't. And they think that whatever it is they've done they justify it somehow. 
Can I just say this? Man, if, if, if you just did something that I could clearly show you in the Bible that what you just did is wrong, and you still think it's okay, how is the Spirit of God not knocking on your door? That scares me. I'm not saying you're not saved. What I'm saying is, is how can the Spirit of God not be knocking on your door? How could He not be knocking on your door? How can we get to a place where we're comfortable with what it is we have done? We can't get to a place uh, where life uh, is, is, is all about uh, uh, continued sin. If we're not moved to do something about it, something's not right. Good time to examine yourself. Good time. Ephesians 2, 1 and 3, if you remember uh, when we talked about this, right? He has quickened us. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past, we walked according to the course of this world. John tells us, love not the world or the things of this world. But in times past, that's how we walked. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of Antichrist. And even now that spirit works in the children of disobedience. Can a Christian be disobedient? See? Remember I just said that we can have the spirit of Antichrist in us? Listen, you could be a professed Christian you could be saved and still be a child of disobedience. Okay? What, what Paul's saying here is what they were doing is they were fulfilling the desires of their flesh and of their mind, in my opinion. In my opinion. Well, what I think. How many people have come through this church when they bring me whatever it is, if they even give me the opportunity, even the, 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 the right, which, by the way, would be the absolute right thing to do is go to the pastor and tell him why you're leaving. That's absolutely the right thing to do. Okay? I don't care if it's a, a, a church that's not doing right. You still should go to the pastor and tell him why you're leaving. You should tell them what's going on and why you're leaving. Okay? Okay, but, 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 but how many times have people come to me and just given me their opinion? It's disobedience. You've trumped your thoughts with God's thoughts. It is the spirit of Antichrist. Pastor, this is a tough message, but is it in the Bible? I, I'm just trying to help us, man. It, wrong is wrong. Children of wrath is wrong. What John's talking about here is the difference between the children of God and the children of devil. And he's not saying that if you're doing the actions that a child of the devil would do, that you're not saved. He's not saying that, nor am I saying that. What I am saying is, however, is if you are doing those things, why would you do those things? That is what the child of the devil would do. That is what the, ant, the spirit of Antichrist would do. You're a child of God. Why would you do that? Do you see what Paul... You, or, uh, got the wrong guy here. Do you see what John's saying here? He's going, listen, this, is, this should not be... Sin should not be the normal thing in your life. See, somebody who's not saved has no divine resources to draw on. His, his uh, profession of faith, if any, is not real. This is a distinction in view of 1 John 3, 1-10. through 10. A true believer does not live in sin. He may commit sin, he may commit an occasional wrong, but he will not practice sin. He will not make it a settled habit in their life. And the beautiful thing about Ephesians 3 is after it goes through those first three verses, what does verse 4 say? But God. Amen? God butted in. God butted into that and saved us. What? manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Moving forward, things should be different. Be in practice what is your position. 1 John 3 focuses on two characteristics of the child of God. Okay? The first part, uh, these first ten verses, which I'm preaching to you this morning, is a true child of God practices righteousness. 
The second part, which Pastor Robert will preach to you next week, is that the true God, uh, child of God uh, loves the brethren. Can, can, can I add? Despite their differences. Because their differences should never be different if the wor- 1 Corinthians 1.10 is still in the Bible. Your opinions about what you think do not matter. We need to be unity in the Spirit to the Word of God. If we're in unity to the Spirit of the Word of God, then we love the brethren. We love the brethren. A true child of God uh, practices righteousness. This is not to say work salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 is still in the Bible. We cannot practice righteousness enough to one day be saved. Okay, so that's not what John's saying here. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that uh, He had made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the what? The righteousness of God in Him. Our life was made His. Positionally speaking, we are righteous. Amen? Amen? What the Lord wants is for us to be in practice what our position is. Why do I keep doing that? Something's going on here. Uh, You are a new creature. You're not your own. The old man has died. Galatians 2.20. Amen? As a new creature, you have a new mission. You are an ambassador of Christ. You are a minister of reconciliation. Get rid of the residue of the old you. You cannot practice righteousness when you're being driven by your flesh. That is the idea of what's going on here in 1 John. What if practicing sin is your way of life? If you are comfortable with it, it's the difference between uh, understanding what true conviction is about that thing when, uh, when you're involved in, a, in a, an occasional sin and, and being comfortable with sinning. Why do you choose to live in sin and stay in sin and accept God to honor what He has promised to you? If, if you're staying in the sin, do you think God's going to honor you? He has not promised that. And let me just tell you, you are definitely out of fellowship with Him. Sin always comes with a price. This is how you know it's quite possibly wrong. When something earth-shaking happens, it always comes with a price. If you break fellowship with God, if you break fellowship with others, for unbiblical reasons, a price will be paid. Unless you have the Bible to do uh, or to break fellowship with what you're doing, unless there's a biblically grounded reason, We're walking in darkness. And it's wrong. Sin in an unsaved person is normal and natural. Right? The unsaved person, even if they confess, they live a life of sin and have no issue with it. Look at Proverbs 29.1. Look what this says here. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. Listen, here's the, 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 the biggest issue that I've seen in the church today, but in my 10 years of being the pastor of this church. People sometimes get upset at me because I just say what the Bible says. And sometimes I harp on things, okay? When I know that those things are really important and that, that we're having a problem with it, yeah, I, I got you, man. I harp on it. I, I get it. I understand it. Sometimes I may take it too far, but the point is, is what I am saying is still right. Okay? That's the reality. Look what that says. He that being often reproved hardened his neck. You see, if what is being said is right, and you just don't like that it's being said over and over, you're hardening your neck. You're, you're getting so callous to it that it doesn't matter to you anymore. And listen, it says that person's going to suddenly be destroyed and without remedy. And so often I've seen people do that, walk out of this church. Listen, I'll say this, but let me, let me just say it. They'll walk out of this church and they'll go to another church and the first thing they do is go to another church that doesn't, bring, doesn't preach from a King James Bible. I would say they've suddenly been destroyed and there's no remedy for them now. Have at it, man. Enjoy. I hope that what you just did works for you. I hope. I don't think it's going to be, though, because the Bible's still the Bible. 
And God's still God. And God still doesn't like sin. There's going to be no fellowship. There's going to be no peace about that thing. There never can be. A true, a true uh, a child of God will not do that. Look at Revelation 3.19. Look what Jesus says. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous. Repent of that thing that you did. Be okay with being rebuked. Be okay with being chastened. That is what a true child of God will do. What does Psalm say? What does Psalm say? You'll never be offended by the Word. Why are we offended by the Word? Pastor, you just keep harping us on that. You just keep... that. But it's still the Word, isn't it? What does it matter? Why are you offended by it? What is, what is wrong with it that you're upset? Hebrews 12, look at this. This is a very eye-opening verses if you pay attention to what he's actually saying. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. He's talking to the, to, 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 you forgot. You forgot. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Sounds an awful lot like Revelation 3.19 to me. For whom the Lord loveth, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God deal with you as with a son. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth now? Now watch this. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. <laughs> Do you understand what he's saying right there? Do, do you get what Scripture's saying right there? If you despise chastisement, if you despise rebuking, if you despise the things of the Lord that's in the Bible, you might be a bastard. There's a tough word. There's a big king. What's a bastard, my friends? Huh? It's someone who doesn't have a father. Y'all get what he's saying right here? He's not talking about you don't have a father physically. Maybe you don't have the father. Sounds pretty serious to me. Sounds like I might want to pay attention that when chastisement is coming from the Word of God and I'm not willing to take that, maybe you're a bastard. Maybe you don't have a father. Maybe he's not your father. That's what he's saying. Listen, it's one of the greatest blessings to get busted. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a good thing to get busted for that thing you're doing wrong. It's a good thing for someone to look at you and go, dude, that ain't right, man. You need to get your... That's a good thing. You want to know why? <laughs> why do you think it's a good thing? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Huh? It's a good thing to get called out on. It's a good thing that conviction sets in. But what you do with it matters. When you are called out on it, when it is brought to your attention, when it is brought to light, what you do with it matters. Because if you're still willing to shove it under the rug, <laughs> listen, I'm not here to judge. I don't know if you're saved or not. I'm not saying it. All I know is, Something ain't right. Something's not right. How can we live in that? Are we callous to it? Do we have no spirit to guide us through those things? Either way, I do believe it's worthy of getting nervous. I've said it. Anyone can speak Christianese. Anyone can say, praise God. Anyone can say, God bless you. Anyone can say, I love you, brother. Anyone can say those things while they stab you in the back like a sinner would. Tough message, huh? I know it is. Let me close with this. There are three reasons to live a holy life. Three reasons and I'm done. Number one, God the Father loves us. Verse number one. If, if he would uh, live 
if we would live in a spirit of thanksgiving, overwhelmed that God the Father loves you, then if we really let Romans 5, 8 and 9 sink in, but God commended His love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If we really let those things happen, if we really would let the idea sink in that we are children of God, if we really understood Romans 18, 19 to 23, that talks about how that, that one day uh, we're going to have the redemption of our body. Take, if we really understood those things, that one day we are literally going to be like Him, we wouldn't be doing some of the things we do to one another. We wouldn't have the, we wouldn't have the Spirit to do it. Huh? Anybody? Come on. We wouldn't have the Spirit to do it. Because the Spirit of God wouldn't do that. The Spirit of Antichrist would. Y'all with me on this? So the three reasons for living a holy life. Because the God, the Father, loves us. And you know what? You know what? God the Father loves Justin just as much as God the Father loves Chris, just as much as God the Father loves Ray, and just as much as God the Father loves you, and just as much as God the Father loves me. And if we're willing to do that to one another, who are we really doing it to? Who are we really doing it to? If we lived our lives in that way, we wouldn't treat each other the way we do. You wouldn't have time to be judgmental of somebody else because you'd be too busy looking in the mirror to see what you're doing wrong. Hey, I'm not saying, and I'm not advocating that if somebody clearly does something that's outside of Scripture that we shouldn't be telling them. That is love. But come on, let's be honest. Most of the time, that's not what happens. We throw out accusations on people. We don't even know their situation. We think we know what's going on. We think we have an idea of what's going on. We're completely clueless about it because we don't like it. We're going to call them out on that. Oh, yeah. You got scripture for that? Oh, you don't? How about this? Zip it. Why would you do that to a brother? Why would you do that to a sister? God the Father's in them just as much as He's in you. Or maybe God the Father is not in you. Because God the Father wouldn't do that. Y'all, y'all, y'all with me on this? Huh? What, what did Jesus say? Hey! He who's got no sin, throw the first stone. Go for it! You got no sin? Throw the stone. Well, I got sin. I ain't throwing that stone. You see what I'm saying? God the Father loves you. That's a good reason to live a holy life. Another good reason to live a holy life is God the Son died for you. Verses 4 through 8. John turned here from from, uh, uh, the future appearing of Jesus in verse 2 to his past appearing in verse 5. John gave two reasons why Jesus came and died. Number one, to take away your sins. Amen? Huh? And number two, to destroy the works of the devil. For a child of God to sin indicates that he does not understand or appreciate what Jesus did for him on the cross. Did y'all hear what I just said? To continue in sin means you do not appreciate what Jesus did for you on the cross. Christ appeared to take away our sins. Listen, there are a couple different definitions of sin in the Bible, if you will. uh, Different ways that God uh, shows us forth that. Uh, Romans 14, 23, uh, he says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. How about that one? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the... Whatsoever is not of Scripture is sin. Hmm. That's why I often say, I hope you have Scripture to back up what your opinion is right now. Because if you don't, It's sin. You want to know why it's sin? Because you're allowing your opinion to direct your action now. That's sin. The thought of foolishness is sin. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doesn't do it, it's sin. 
Listen, most of y'all have been in this church long enough, and you've heard me and Pastor Robert preach long enough about stuff. You know what's right or wrong. You know what Scripture says. Yet you'll still do it. That's sin. All. How much does that say right there? All unrighteousness is sin. What's 1 John 3 talking about? Righteousness, unrighteousness. The child of God, child of the devil. All unrighteousness is, how much? All. All. John's epistle defines sin, and notice that in verse number 6, he defines sin as the transgression of the law. Now listen, be clear, okay? The law is not what we're under. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is those Ten Commandments, you transgress those, those are, that is sin. That is sin. The first three commandments, strangely enough, the first three, because the first one's God the Father, the second one's God the Son, the third one's God the Spirit. Go ahead and look at those first three commandments. You'll see that's what, exactly what it's pointing at. Have to do with love the Lord thy God <laughs> with all your heart, soul, and mind, right? That's the first three. And then the uh, uh, commandment five through ten has to do with who? One another. And so what does Jesus say? Which commandment should I, should I follow? Well, there's two. <laughs> two. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Commandments one, two, and three. And love your brother, your neighbor, as yourself. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's almost like God wrote the book. It's almost like he knew exactly what he was doing. And God says that uh, transgression of the law is sin. It's defilement. Listen, let me say this. Sin in its true nature is defiance. Did y'all hear what I just said? That's what it is. You are, def- you are, you are being obedient or disobedient, defiance, to God. Which one is it? That God is love does not mean he has no rules and regulations for his family. Any good father would have rules and regulations for the family, would they not? Huh? How about 1 John 2, 3? And hereby we do know that we know him. How? If we keep his commandments. Huh? How about 1 John 3, 22? And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Listen, He is not obligated or honored or has to honor anything if you're not keeping His commandments and you're not doing... 1 John 3, 22 makes that clear. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. 1 John 5, 2. Sin is basically a matter of the will. For us to assert our will against God's will is what? Rebellion. That's what it is. And rebellion is the root of sin. No matter what the outward action may be, a sinner's inward attitude is one of rebellion. Look at verse, uh, verse 6 there in 1 John. What does he say there? Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. You know, that word abide is an interesting word. It's one of John's favorite words. He uses it quite a bit. He, he talks about how abiding in Christ means to be in fellowship with Him, to allow nothing to come between ourselves and Christ. There is more in the death of Christ on the cross than simply our salvation from judgment. As wonderful as that is, through His death, Christ broke the power of sin in our lives. How awesome is that, Amen. Huh? How awesome is that? Romans 6, for the sake of time, I won't have you turn there. I was going to have you turn there. But go back and read Romans 6, especially verses 11 through 13. Really pay attention to what that's saying. Listen, He has given us the power to yield, but you are the one in control of the yielding. You have to understand that. We have to understand that. Okay, when you yield to your members, you are at that moment the devil's servant. Please understand that. 
Doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means in that thing that you're doing right now, you are his servant. Finally, number three, and I'm done. God the Holy Spirit lives in us. God the Holy Spirit lives in us. Whosoever is born of God, the Bible says here in 1 John, does not commit sin. Why? Because he has a new nature within him, and that new nature is not bent towards sin. When a person receives Christ as a Savior, a tremendous spiritual change takes place in them. He is given a new standing before God, being accepted as righteous in God's sight. This new standing in the Bible is called justification. Justification can never be earned, it can never change, and it can never be lost. And all the church should say, Amen, Amen to that. Okay? But what we need to have understand is that the new Christian is also given a new position. He is set apart. Sanctified. Sanctification. He's set apart for God's own purpose to live for God's glory. This can change day to day. This is why God says, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Put yourself to death daily. Sanctify. Cleanse yourself from within daily. But perhaps the most dramatic change in a new believer is what we call regeneration. Regeneration. We are born again into the family of God. Justification means a new standing before God. Sanctification means being set apart to God. And regeneration means a new nature. We've taken on God's nature. The only way to enter God's family is by being, what does John 3, 3 say? Must be born again. It's the only way. Physical life produces what? Death. Yeah, that's true. But physical life can only produce physical life that leads to death. That's all it can produce. But a spiritual life should produce what? Spiritual life. That's why John 3, 6 says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Christians have been born again. We are not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible. What is the incorruptible seed? What does Peter say there? The word of God which liveth in you and abides for how long? Forever. In the miracle of the new birth, the Holy Spirit imparts new life. Whose life? God's life to a believing sinner. And as a result, we are born into the family of God. Just as a physical child bears the nature of their parents, so should God's spiritual children bear His nature as His divine seed is in Him. As Christians, uh, the old nature from his physical birth and the new nature from his spiritual birth, there should be an obvious difference. Let me give you this real quick. The New Testament contrast is clear, right? Our old man, Romans 6.6. 6. The new man, Colossians 3.10. The flesh, Galatians 5.24. The spirit, Galatians 5.17. The corruptible seed, 1 Peter 1.23. Incorruptible seed. 1 John 3, 9. The old nature produces sin, but the new nature leads one into a holy life. A Christian's responsibility is to live according to his new nature. One way to illustrate this is by contrasting the outer man with the inner man, i.e. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. The physical man needs food, and so does the inner man. Did you all hear what I just said? Get the contrast now. Physical to spiritual. I promise you, I promise you this is important. Let me finish this and we're done. I'm on my last page here, so I promise you I'm almost done. I know I've said that quite a few times, but I am almost done. And it's only 12, 15, we're good. Listen, the Bible says man shall not live by bread alone. That's physical. But by what? Every, how many words? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth. Listen, you better have them. You better have every word if you need to live by them. By the way, I think that's pretty important because you're going to be judged by them. Huh? Uh-huh. Unless a Christian spends time in the Word of God, the inner man's going to lack power. Right? You can't, just, you can't just live your life. Listen, can you sit at a table and watch me eat food and be full? Huh? No, 
no, you have to eat the food too, right? Right? Most people, though, in the church house today, that's the way they're living. They're just sitting at the table while somebody else is eating. If they're even eating good food. Y'all with me? All I know is Psalm 119.9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto, thereunto according to thy word. A Christian who feeds the new nature from the word of God will have power to live a godly life. A Christian who does that will make no provision for the flesh and they will not fulfill the lust thereof, Romans 13, 14. The physical man needs cleansing. I, I hope everybody took a shower this morning. Huh? If you didn't take a shower for, you know, three days or four days, a week, and you come up in here, do you think you might start to stink? Huh? Huh? What if you didn't take a shower for a month? Do you think you stink? Huh? Listen, but listen, man, get, get, get what I'm saying. But that's where most people that are calling themselves Christians live this morning. They haven't cleansed, cleansed themselves from this word in months, sometimes years. And guess what? What's coming off them stinks. It stinks. Y'all get it? We wash our hands and face frequently. At least I hope you do. A believer should look into the mirror of God's Word daily and examine himself. He must confront his sins and not just confront them, but do something about them. Because if we don't, it will breed infection and it will bring about spiritual sickness. It's what happens. Yielding to sin is a distinguishing mark of the children of the devil. If you yield to sin, it's a distinguishing, a distinguishing mark of a child of the devil. They may profess or claim one thing, but they're practicing something completely different. How does a child of God go about overcoming the desires of the old nature? He must begin each day by yielding his body to God as a living sacrifice. Romans 12.1 He must spend time in the Word of God, feeding his new nature. He must take time to pray. He must ask God to fill him with the Holy Spirit. He must ask God to give him the power to serve Christ and glorify him. As he goes through the day, a believer must depend on the power of the Spirit in the inner man. And that way, when temptation comes, he's able to turn to Christ for victory. That person is the one that can say, the word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against him. Psalm 119.11 This is why I do believe what church you go to and what they teach and what they preach matters. Because if you're being fed McDonald's on a daily basis, or if you're being fed McDonald's on a weekly basis, because that's all you ever go to church, if you even do that, you know what? You know what? You will start to stink. You will. It is a reality, and it should be considered and taken very seriously. Because your relationship, your ability to fellowship with Him is at stake. A true believer does not practice sin. A counterfeit believer cannot help but practice sin because he does not have God's new nature within, within him. But these words written by John here uh, were not written uh, so that you might be able to look around and check everybody else. They were inspired so that we may examine our own selves. Each of us must answer honestly before God these last five things. Right here. Look at do I, who are you? That's how I started this. Do I have the divine nature within me? Or am I merely pretending to be a Christian? Do I cultivate this the divine nature by Bible reading and prayer? Has any unconfessed sin defiled my inner man? And am I, am I willing to confess it? Am I willing to forsake it? I might even say, am I willing to make amends for it? Fix it. Fix the problem. Do I allow my old nature to control my thoughts and desires, or does the divine nature rule me? When temptation comes, do I play with it, or do I flee from it? Do I yield to the divine nature within me? The life that is real is honest with God about these vital issues. And that's the charge I want to give to you as we move into the new year. Who are you? Who are you as a member of One Baptist Church? Are you a child of God and His righteousness? Or are you 
I'm not saying you're not saved. I want to make sure nobody walks out of here thinking that that's what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, though, is, or are you being led by the children of disobedience? Only you can answer that for yourselves. But do know, we all see. We all can see what's going on. We can see how your actions are being displayed and what your actions show. You understand what I'm saying? Is that, is that fair? Did we learn anything this morning? Kind of a tough message, I get it. But man, I really think that's a good one. I think there's some, a lot of truth in that that I hope that we're all willing to... I, want to, I don't want anybody to walk out of here thinking that I'm questioning anybody's salvation. Or I would, I'm just reading the passage, man. It's my job to read the passage and teach you the passage for what it says. Kind of a tough one, but you know what? At the same time, I think it's a good one. I think it's good for all of us to challenge ourselves as we go into 2023. The very first thing we need to start with is don't be a Jaguars fan. Whatever you're doing there, stop it right now. Okay? That is sin. Okay? And stop with the sin. Yeah, I, no, I can't. <laughs> but I will say this. I'm not sore about the Cowboys. We're already in the playoffs. We don't have to beat the Titans to get in. Ah, no, I'm not. We didn't need the game. You all did. I'm happy you won. It was a good game. Listen, what I will say, though, is the Cowboys have